<laughs> okay. So um, I volunteered myself up to do a talk. So I'm Simon Miles. <clears throat> um, last 20 odd years I've been working in GIS. Uh, started off as an archaeologist. Um, got bored of that. I wrote to my local council, actually physically wrote a letter to my local council and said, hey, I can turn on a computer and I know something about GIS. Will you give me a job? And they said, yes, start Monday. And that was it. I, I've, that was my career in GIS started off, um, which made a great change because I got bored of if enough pot noodles and out of B&Bs. So over the last 20 years, I've worked in uh, numerous local authorities, uh, chiefly doing kind of <clears throat> GIS data, um, development work, kind of that, that sort of stuff. Now, when people say GIS, what is that? I kind of just say it's a general information service. Because within local government, people that do GIS know everything about everyone. I kind of like busybodies, really. But, um, so yeah, uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, I moved across the rails and went into working into the private sector and started working for Geosphere. So that's kind of my spotted background. So today, this is my pet project, uh, nothing to do with the company, and it's all about um, PowerShell, GDAL, and open data. <clears throat> so first off, off the bat, PowerShell is actually open source. Now, it's open source with a closed, small open source, in as much as you can't really contribute to the code of it, but it's freely available. So it's kind of a... Uh, an oxymoron in that instance. But being open source, uh, in 2016 it was opened up across multiple platforms and is actually a .NET um, framework. Works on Linux, Macs and obviously natively out of Windows. Um, for the installs, I typically am a Mac user, so I use something called Homebrew for a uh, uh, Linux, you can just use a package manager to get it installed and up and running. GDAL, hopefully we all know what GDAL is. Fingers crossed, lots of nods, good. Again, brilliant tool. Um, chiefly used just to kind of just translate vector and RAS data. But increasingly these days is actually found in lots and lots of software, QGIS, Esri, FME, for example, all baked into that. And then we've got our favorite open data. Again, cross-platform, thanks to Gordon Brown in 2010, kind of delivering that kind of, hey, we're going to start producing open data, and that I'm going to whisper the word inspire uh, of open data as well. So when we take all those three things together, we've got a good start to kind of play around with stuff. So PowerShell. I love PowerShell, okay? I think it's a cool, cool language. Not very many people probably think that at all, and probably hardly anybody. Has anyone actually ever used PowerShell in anger? Two, three, four, that's quite cool. Um, it's just, just a, a cool thing, and I think you'll find my enthusiasm and love for it will hopefully kind of flesh out through this. So why do I like PowerShell? And thankfully Dave's gone, it's because I don't like Python. Okay, it's really easy to read, and we'll go through some of this in a second. So two lines of code, and I can get today's date printed out. But, you know, I've got an indent here. Hello, my little friend Python. Indent, quack, quack, oops, we've got an error, okay? PowerShell doesn't really care where the code is, as long as it's in some sort of linear structure. And, my favorite part about it, gets me giggling every time, is the file extension is a PS1. So I love that. So, in terms of its actual structure, it's written in this kind of verb-noun structure. So we've got things like write, get, start, um, clear, etc. And then we've got verbs to do, um, a noun to do things to it. Really, really simple things to kind of to do. But we can obviously start expanding upon those kind of simple things. So here, I've declared a, a DIR, a variable of the local directory. And I've now daisy-chained that to create a log file. I've written a message 
And then actually in my last line of code, I've appended that message to my log file, easy as. So if I was to run that as a bit of code, I'd get a nice little message. You can go further, just like you can do with um, kind of any kind of language in, we can start putting if and else statements in. So for example, in this example, if the log file exists, write out to the host console, the file exists. If it doesn't exist, write out to the console. It doesn't exist, and then just create me the log file. Bargain. GDAL. Not necessarily as much in love with GDAL, I must say, and I probably find it a little bit boring. It just does stuff for me, A to B. I'm not so much in love with it. And there are a thousand and one things that you could probably do with GDAL, but for my purposes, I'm just pretty much interested in this OGR stuff. Effectively, OGR, go get me a file, in this instance, uh, a shape file, and convert that out to a GML file. We can use obviously stuff like GDAL info, info to get the version number, and uh, OGR info to find a bit more about that, that data if we needed to. And then you can kind of do the quote unquote sexy stuff with it. You can start getting it to talk to databases, for example. So in my life when I was at Surrey Heath, um, Borough Council, that's where I kind of truly fell in love with Postgres. We were using um, PowerShell and OGR to kind of go get data out of an Oracle database and just push it over into a Postgres database. Simple as that. Save your, can save your fortune, especially if you, you know, can't afford like an FME license. Very simple to use OGR to do that sort of stuff. And then open data. Everyone loves a little bit of open data, as we saw today. You know, ordnance survey, lots of goodiness there. Dave's presentation this morning about kind of consuming lots and lots of open data. So, with that in mind, we'll take all those three things. Cultural reference, hopefully everyone gets it. Excellent. Jack, do you get it? No, good. I'll explain later. Let's go for this and see what we can do. So, in terms of open data here, I'm looking at data here from planning.data.gov, and I've said I want to go and get some conservation area data as a geojson. That's my URL structure, my data source. I want to write out a, a shape file, and I'm just going to call that a CA shape file. And I can run that as a code. Yeah, straight as that, and I'll get some data down. But actually, I want to use PowerShell to do something. So I'm actually going to kind of write that into two lines of code, give it a variable. Here's my long string of my data path. And now I've passed that variable into my GDAL, uh, sorry, into my um, PowerShell. Now I'm going to run it. And if I run that in the command line, two lines, and I actually get warnings up. Why do I get warnings? Because of good old friend shapefile doesn't like column length sizes. So just chuck me some warnings. If I wrap that all into a single file, I can run that one single file, and I still get my error warnings. But hopefully, at the end of it, I'll get some data down that I can use later. Kind of bringing it back to kind of the Windows stuff, if I wanted to, I could actually put that PowerShell PS1 file and pass it through into a bat file so that I could actually then start to schedule that if I really wanted to as well. So quite nicely, you can start to schedule things to do, bring data from A to B, do something with it. But, there's always a but in the stories. Not all open data is easy open data to access. So, case in point, uh, natural England. And I've kind of gone off to the special areas of conservation data, and I said, okay, what have we got there? Well, brilliant, we've got lots of different file formats that we can actually download. Brilliant. Unfortunately, the URLs are dynamic, which in my case for my PowerShell script is a quack quack coops. It's not gonna work anymore. So, unfortunately, I never thought I'd have to say this. This is Esri to the rescue. Now, Esri to the rescue here is in the shape of ArcGIS server. 
So a lot of this open data that's been published by the um, Environment Agency, English Nature, etc., all sits on ArcGIS server. And that is the principal way that they serve that data out. So here in this data set, we can see we've got the services, we've got the data itself, and we can actually kind of have a look at that data. This data is what's called a feature service. And that's kind of Esri's version of a WFS. Okay? They also have a map server service, which is akin to WMS. So you can't really use this for that kind of functionality. But once you get into ArcGIS server, and you scroll right down the bottom, and the caveat here is that this supported operations is not necessarily true for all ArcGIS services that you can find, you can find this little query button. Now, if you go back into this query button, effectively, you've got this huge table of kind of how you can query the data. I've kind of cheated and said, well, I know there's a column in that data called object, so where that object ID is bigger than zero, and I'm gonna change my format to GeoJSON, and if I now press query, boom, I now no longer have a dynamic URL, I've got a static URL to go and get that data. So, I could go back to basics, and boom, here's my GDAL. But it's very, very long. So, how do we kind of get around this? We then use our little friend PowerShell. Oh, actually, I forgot earlier. We need a map, because actually this presentation had no other maps, so I thought I'd put this one in here. This is the data, and there we go. That's where we are at the moment. We can then put that into a PowerShell, and we can actually break this down into variables. On the whole, this query will never change, but the base URL and the service may well change. Therefore, we can actually now start to use this PowerShell script as a reusable script for other data sources. So now, if I append all those variables together and stick them into a new variable, tell it my output source, i.e. a GeoJSON, boom! This is my, my SAC PS1, one line of code, go get my stuff. And that's what it kind of looks like. Seven lines of code to go and get that data. And as I said, it's now reusable, so I could take that PS1 file, change its name, change the service, maybe the base um, URL, if it's a different ArcGIS service you're kind of querying, and off I go. I can now schedule that if I put it into Windows, into a BAT file, and I can go and pull data as and when I like. But that's kind of a bit boring. Let's see if we can add on any kind of other functions to this. So right at the start, I was showing how you can use um, all the other kind of goodiness within uh, PowerShell, and I'm probably only using like 1% of the goodiness. I can now loop through from eight, my lines uh, 8 to 13, set a working directory, set some date stamps, create my log file, my message, an append message, so that when I run this now, I'll get a log file that says, hey, you've successfully downloaded. But that's not necessarily the whole truth. We can go one step better. We can actually now expand our code out from our little original seven lines and make loads of code. So we can now say to it, okay, I've got a load of different variables at the top, i.e. the location of my working directory uh, and my date stamps. I've got the same structure before of the services, et cetera, that I'm calling. I've got now some variables over kind of how I'm going to name things. So we've still got our output as a GeoJSON that we download, but I've also added in this other variable of a shapefile. I've also put in some stuff in there to do with renaming files so that I can actually see um, an archive of data that I've downloaded. And I've put in a load of messaging as well. So now, if I kind of use that if else kind of statement again, I can basically go off and do a test. Okay, go get me, uh, initially, test to see if I have a GeoJSON already downloaded. If I do, rename it and archive it, give it a date stamp, okay? Once you've done that, go away, go get me some data set from, uh, and put it down as a GeoJSON. 
Now, after that, I want you just to make sure that it has actually downloaded successfully. If it has, tell me it has. If it hasn't, log message me out. Ideally, looking at this code again, I should have probably put another exit actually in here so it actually just kills the script at that point. But after I've done that, I've kind of then gone back and said, okay, I've got a GeoJSON that's downloaded, but now I want to convert that into a shape file, and I want you definitely to convert that into the projection of British National Grid. Now, once all that's done, I've now got some final tests to make sure that my shapefile has actually downloaded and been processed. Exit. So that is how, effectively, I use PowerShell to kind of go get data, pull it down, do something to it, move it. But you can go much, much further. So my introduction, as I said, to PowerShell was at Surrey Heath. And there, that was less geo, and it was actually more data stuff. So what they used to do was they had a mixture of using Node.js and FME to effectively go off to an SFTP server, get some data, pull it down, do something to it, and push it off to another SFTP server. And they would say, you're using FME and Node.js to do this. I wrote a PowerShell script that effectively said, OK, one, go test to see if the SFTP server is up. If it is up, write a log message to it. If it's down, send a message, and here we go here, send a message to Teams to notify that the SFTP server is actually down. Then I want you to, uh, if it is up, go get that data, bring it down, munge it together with different data sets, okay? Possibly run a bat file to go and get another data set from somewhere else, bring that down, merge it, carry on sending messages to Teams, carry on logging it, finally use an SFTP to ping it off to somewhere else. All in well, one script, schedule task, off you go. So that was my introduction to PowerShell, and that's kind of where this kind of has led to me now. You can also use PowerShell to go one step further. And I was going to demo this, but it wasn't quite working as sweetly as I'd hoped. But you can invoke PowerShell scripts on remote servers. So for example, I went on to AWS to set up a little light sale instance, uh, made sure my PowerShell was installed, put a script on there, and within the terminal of my Mac, I could actually call that PowerShell script to do something. So I could pull it remotely. You can also use PowerShell within Lambda. So if you're familiar with AWS Lambda, you can actually use PowerShell within that. And as I said earlier, you can actually use PowerShell to use to ping SFTP servers. And that is my ramble. All about PowerShell, uh, GDAL, and open data. Any questions? Um. Is it on? Oh. Okay. I've done similar things in the past, um, just for fun. Um, and one of the problems I had at the time was the future, uh, the future limit in the R RGIS server sometimes. So 500 or, or 1,000 uh, features. Um, but I stopped there So um, because it was a pain in the ass just to uh, do the operation because sometimes if you have 20,000 records, yeah. you have to execute that 20 times, for example, and, and things like that. So how, how, how do you cope with uh, that feature limit uh, in IGIS server? Do you just randomly execute the, the so script? In that, in you that gather the IDs and then you make a list of the... So in that instance, I've never had to call huge data sets mm, okay. for that instance using PowerShell. If I was going to do something like that, then I would just fall back to my old friend FME and oh. kind of loop through the data to look for it okay. back. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs>